now get into chapter 2, the implanted word. Why do we need this engrafted word spoken of by James? James chapter 1, verse 21. Read Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 through 8, and you will find out. As you read through these texts, ask yourself the questions. When do I plant or pluck up? When do I kill or heal? When do I break down or build up? When do I weep or laugh? When do I mourn or dance? When do I cast away stones or gather stones together? When do I embrace or refrain from embracing? When do I get? When do I lose? When do I keep or cast away? When do I rent or sell? When do I keep silent? When do I speak? When do I love? When do I hate? When is it time for war? And when is it time for peace? Many times we labor with many of these questions and gather knowledge to deal with each. Yet we lack wisdom to know when, where, how, and why. We can flip a coin and pray for the best, or we can follow what has been written. Ask. Matthew 7, verses 7 to 11 or 8. If at first you receive no answer when you ask, then follow this word of wisdom. Continued uncertainty is reason to wait. Link this to Galatians chapter 5, verse 5. For we wait through the Spirit for the hope, unseen answer or engraved word, the hope of righteousness by faith. Then with expectancy, follow this word of wisdom. God sways the judgment of the willing, expectant heart. Those expect to be led will be led. In light of this, and an engrafted word was once given to me, the word wait. I had asked for an answer with a particular problem, and the response I got was wait. One word. I asked, is that it? The reply was no. There is more to it. Now catch this. The word wait was broken down letter by letter, and here was the result. W, without. A, any. I, interfering. And T, thoughts. I rolled with laughter when I got this. This is usually my problem with waiting for an engrafted word, interfering thoughts. I have found that the best way to beat this inter these interfering thoughts is to do your asking, then go off and do some distracting work, getting your mind off the question. Or simply relax, as I am doing right now, typing this piece for you all. This piece, by the way, is an answer to what I had to ask earlier for moral on this hearing from God, the Father. Father, this is great. Thanks. Chapter 3, Abram's Righteousness Note this, it's hundreds of years after the biblical flood. Humanity is right back into their pagan ways and God is looking for one individual to communicate to. He finds one, Abram, who later becomes known as Abraham, the father of many nations. Abram listens to God and is shown what plans God has for his life and his future outcome. Because Abram listened, hear what, it is, what is said next. And God counted this unto him as righteousness. Genesis 15, 6. In what is called the first mention principle, this is the first mention of this term righteousness. Usually in his first mentioning, a term in scripture will follow the same in context throughout scripture. So what do we see in this first mention in the context of this text, the term righteousness? There is only one thing that, and that alone. Abram asks questions, then hears God speak to him, and he listens. God responds to him. God's response to him. 
what action to start. Genesis 15, 9, 10, and 11. Beyond that act, that act only, and notice that act to Abram came from God, God does what Abraham could not do. Genesis 15, verse 15. God passes through the pieces. Read Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 in light of this. For it is God which works in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So righteousness clearly does not take on what many feel it means, self-behavior. As a matter of fact, God places Abram into a deep sleep, and then he, God, does the work. Genesis 15, 12. You can see Paul's expressed and demonstrated here. 1 Timothy 4, 8. Body exercise profits little, but godliness, God's action of passing through the pieces, in Abram's case, is profitable unto all things, having promise of life that now is and of that which is to come. This also it can also be linked to what Jesus said in Matthew eleven, twenty nine to thirty. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. The question that should be asked at this point is learn what? The answer would be to listen to him, as he clearly demonstrated. He, Jesus, listened to the Father while incarnated in a body and a servant mode. As he listened to the Father's voice, we now listen for the Son's voice, Christ in us. It was promised that this would occur via the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, who would not speak of himself, but would lead us to Christ in us, who would lead us to the Father, clearly demonstrating a perfect unity in diversity, something I am developing in a later book. We all know the many texts that reveal Jesus saying, the words I speak are not my own. I see and hear the Father. John 14.10 and others. Understand, he came into our mode of being, thus was subservient, by choice, as we are to be, to God the Father. He asked those of his day, Show me where I have sinned. Sin implying in context, Show me where I have acted independent from listening to the Father's voice. John 8. Verses 46, 47, 48. In a servant mode, he set aside any dependent use of any attribute he possessed before coming in a body. Thus he never sinned or acted independent from hearing the, the Father's will concerning his actions and direction of life. He walked constantly in the Spirit and did not give what he called the flesh, world opinions, and ideas, and views, and perspectives place. He... Throughout his life, up to even the garden scene, called the flesh weak, yet the spirit strong. We being born through the weakness of Adam's flesh, his views, perspectives, and so forth, find ourselves in a reverse situation where the flesh is strong and the spirit weak. We find ourselves in a constant wrestling match with this flesh wrestling against the spirit. Our carnal, fleshly thoughts and opinions conflict with what we not only read in scripture but in maturity learn to hear from Christ in us two voices engrossed in battle something I have uh, I have addressed later in this book the key as I have expressed is first learning of the self thought and its patterns while doing so we learn to see the difference and can learn to hear those things God so desires to speak to us one-on-one. -on -one. We are commanded to not be conformed to this world, but to be transformed, metamorphosed, by the renewing of our mind, Romans 12, 2. It is, only, it is only after a degree of renewal that we begin to walk in the Spirit and not the flesh. One degree of glory to another degree of glory from faith, hearing God speak to us, to faith, it is the written word of God that is shown to us as a light that shines in this dark place that we can once again, through what Christ has accomplished, come boldly to the throne of grace, sitting on our Father's knee, crying, Abba, Daddy, and have him respond to us. 
Truly, he is there, and he is not silent.